right, good morning, church family. So my name's Caleb Rhodes. I am a, officially I'm a second year resident here, but discipleship resident is my title. I'm working with the uh, new discipleship pastor that we have hired, and we are so excited. Speaking of discipleship, I want to point you towards this grow book. You know, as a church, our mission is we exist to lead all generations to love and follow Jesus. And this is a great example of what we are doing as a church to do just that. As TJ said, we're highlighting marriage ministry today, marriage core. We've got a table set up in the commons. No matter what stage you're at in your marriage, whether you're just getting started or if you've been married several decades, there's a place for you at the table with marriage core because marriage core slogan is good marriages don't just happen. Another fantastic Wednesday night thing that I want to highlight quickly is our foundations level classes. So maybe you're a new believer, maybe you've been a believer for some time, but you still don't have some of the basic questions of the faith answered. Questions like, where did our Bible come from? Can we trust it? What are the spiritual gifts? How do I know what my spiritual gifts are? How do I use those spiritual gifts in church? And several other classes just like that. We're going to have those on Wednesday nights. And those, it would really help us if you would sign up and get registered so that we knew exactly how many to expect. And I know several of our offerings on Wednesday nights and throughout the week are already filling up. So if you will, help us out and register for those things. Uh, also, Pastor Jeff sends his love from First Baptist McKinney. He's preaching there this morning. He was the pastor there for over a decade. And they're celebrating 150 years as a church. Mm, you thought we were old, man. So yeah, he sends you his love uh, from there and uh, we'll jump in and get started here. So I want to start with a, a story, a story that takes place in northern India. An old farmer in northern India, he bought a whole convoy of quail. Did you know a, a flock of quail was called a convoy? I didn't. Now you do. So when he bought this convoy of quail, he tied a string around the leg of each bird. And then on the end of the string, he tied a little ring. And that ring slipped over a central stick. And all these quail he taught to march in a circle around the stick. And that's just what they did all day. They marched in a circle around the stick. Well, obviously, nobody was interested in buying a convoy of quail that walked in circles. But one day, a devout Hindu man came by and out of compassion for the lives of these animals, he wanted to purchase them. So he told the farmer, he said, I want to buy all the quail that you have. The farmer was excited. So they exchanged money. And as soon as the transaction was complete, the Hindu man said, now, I want you to snip the strings and I want you to set them free. The farmer just kind of laughed and said, why do you want me to do that? And he said, well, they're my quail. I can do with them what I want to. I want you to set them free. The farmer shrugged and said, well, okay. So he snipped the string, and finally the quail were free. What do you think happened? They all flew off. They went their separate ways. They lived happily ever after, right? No. No, they didn't. They actually just kept walking in circles. They didn't know any different. They kept walking in the same predictable circular march. Even though they were free, they were untied, they'd been released, they kept going around in circles as if they were still tied down. And you know, like these birds, I think if we're being honest, it's hard to embrace the freedom to be what God has made us to be. And our key verse in the text this morning says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. And I got to ask the question, are we more like these quail than we would like to admit when it comes to living out our faith? Maybe there's somebody or something that's holding you back this morning from living out this freedom of who God has made you to be. But this morning, our text is going to show us that God, in his grace, literally purchased us from bondage. We have been set free in Christ. And since the strings have been cut, now it is time for us to learn what it looks like to live in the freedom that we now have as followers of Jesus. And we're going to talk about freedom in Christ this morning. And Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15 is going to be our text. And I want us to see three things. I want us to see that in Christ, there is freedom from legalism. In Christ, there is freedom from confusion. And finally, in Christ, there is freedom to love. There is freedom from legalism. There is freedom from confusion. And there is freedom to love. 
So Paul's letter to the Galatian church, if you've been here, we've been in this series of Galatians over the course of the last several weeks. And often this letter is called a polemic, which means that it's warlike or it's hostile. Chuck Swindoll actually describes the composition of Galatians as, quote, an aggressive attack in which one whips out all the rhetorical weapons and he carries out a no-holds-barred assault on the opposing party. And that is exactly what Paul is doing, especially in the first six verses here of chapter 5. Paul is directly attacking the false teaching of legalism. Legalism, as the name suggests, is adherence to a set of rules or to a law in order to achieve salvation or spiritual growth. We see that a lot throughout the New Testament, the apostles and the writers challenging this idea that we have to follow a set of laws or follow the law in order to receive salvation. So in the first six verses here of chapter 5, Paul's going to introduce a contrast between freedom, true freedom, that only exists in Christ Jesus, and the act of circumcision, which is representative of keeping the Old Testament law. So Paul's going to contrast true freedom in Christ with keeping the law through the act of circumcision. Now, to be sure, Paul here is not demonizing the Old Testament law because the Old Testament law was given by God to the people of Israel for a very specific purpose in a very specific time, and it served a very important function in their life. But now that Jesus Christ has come, His life, his death, and his resurrection, it has fulfilled the law. He has fulfilled the law. And all of us who align themselves with Jesus through proclaiming by faith his life, which was perfect, his sacrificial death on our behalf, and his resurrection from the dead, we now receive new life that is no longer defined by our sin, but by freedom in Jesus Christ's righteousness alone. That is the message of the gospel. To simplify it even more, there's two ways. There's two ways to obtain salvation and be reconciled to God. One, keep the whole law and be perfect. If you're sitting here this morning listening to me speak, if you are speaking this morning from the stage, you already messed that one up. None of us are perfect. I don't think that's any news to us. So we're only left with our last option. Our only hope is to receive the free gift of salvation that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That is our only hope for this life and the next. And Paul is reiterating this over and over to the Galatians. So in the first six verses here, we're going to see our first point. In Christ, there is freedom from legalism. Follow along with me as I read verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now, if I had to guess, I would say that many of you are sitting here thinking, Caleb, not one single time this past week have I thought about or have I been confronted with the option of saying, you know, I think I need to circumcise myself in order to ensure my salvation or grow in my faith. If you have, please come talk to me after the service because I would love to know what is going on in your life right now, All right? We don't think that way, but we don't think that way because we're not Jewish. You see, in the Old Testament, God commanded the Jewish people to be circumcised as a sign of his covenant with them. So in other words, before Christ's, if you were not circumcised, you were not in right relationship with God. And so the Judaizers are continuing this teaching, saying even though Christ has come, you still need this sign of circumcision in order to be right with God. But we know that that is not the case, since Christ has fulfilled the law. Now, circumcision is a very painful process, especially for a grown man to have to go through. And many of you have never thought about circumcision as a means of currying God's favor in your life. But I'm almost certain that whether you are a man or a woman, that you have bought into the lie 
that if you work harder, if you give more, or if you sin less, that God will love you more. And if I were to guess, I would say that many of you in this room right now are making decisions based on this type of legalistic thinking that are causing you more pain in your life than even circumcision would. And I think this stems from our repulsion to grace. You may be thinking, repulsion to grace? No, I love grace. Grace is awesome, Caleb. But yeah, but, but think about it. When you receive a gift from someone, when you receive a, a scholarship, you want to feel like, well, I did my part to earn that. I was worthy of receiving the scholarship. I had a good enough GPA. I was worthy to receive that gift of appreciation because I worked really hard for it. We don't like the fact of receiving something that we did absolutely nothing to contribute the value to. We can't wrap our head around the fact that Jesus paid the full price for our sins and we don't owe our just desserts. So when you really get down to it, grace is repulsive to us. But hear me when I say this. You will never be loved any more or any less than you are right now by God. He loves you perfectly on your best days and he loves you perfectly on your worst days. He loves you when you close that multi-million dollar contract. But listen, he loves you just the same when you can't even muster up enough energy to pull yourself out of bed in the morning. God loves you perfectly because God is perfect and his love is unchanging. And just like the Galatian Christians that Paul is writing to, we've all bought into the lie at one point or another that says that we need something other than Jesus. We bought into the lie that, well, we need Jesus plus baptism. We need Jesus plus reading our Bible every day. We need Jesus plus tithing. No, we need Jesus, full stop. Now, are all those things taught in Scripture as things that mature Christians do on a regular basis? Absolutely. But those things proceed from our salvation, they do not function as means of obtaining our salvation. We are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Those other things come as, part, as a process of our sanctification. When we, when we think like that, we're putting the cart before the horse, right? I guess in Dallas, we're putting the, the horse trailer in front of the dually. I'm not sure what the equivalent of that is. But we're, we're thinking backwards, and in verse 1, Paul is commanding the Galatian Christians to stand firm in this truth. Paul had taught them this. And he's exhorting them not to fall back under the burdensome law. Because the law was only given as a means to reveal their sin to them. To reveal the fact that they were in slavery to sin and in need of redemption. The law was never meant to function as a means of obtaining salvation. In Jesus Christ, our works pay no contribution to our salvation. Let me say that again. In Jesus Christ, our works pay no contribution to our salvation. Jesus has freed us from this legalistic thinking. And to believe that you can curry God's favor through your own works and actions is to try to be justified apart from faith in Jesus. And to do that is to misunderstand the message of the gospel. And without the gospel, like I said, we have no lasting hope in this life or the next. So going back to the quails, you know, they, they just couldn't embrace the freedom that they have. They were walking in circles because that was what from, was familiar to them. In fact, if the quails could speak, they might even say something like, well, that's what makes me unique as a quail. You don't see these other quails walking in circles, but look at me. I got 10,000 steps in today. You know how small my legs are? Right? <laughs> they were thinking this way. They were just doing what they had always been taught to do without questioning it, and they weren't interested in exploring what other options they had in life. And what they didn't realize was is that while they were busy walking around on the feet that God gave them, they refused to acknowledge that God had also gifted them with wings that they could fly. Even after they'd received their freedom from the shackles of their old life, they just continued to walk in the same patterns. Why do we do the same thing? After we have been set free in Christ, why do we continue to walk in the same old patterns of life? Paul is exhorting the believers in Galatia, and all believers, to beware of this legalistic mentality and break themselves, to break ourselves of it before it enslaves us. We've been set free from the slavery to sin. We're not supposed to re-enslave ourselves 
to our old ways. The call of the gospel of Jesus Christ is freedom. It's freedom from the slavery of sin. It's freedom from the, freedom from the burden of keeping the law. And Paul is commanding all believers here to defend that freedom with their lives. Now, I'll tell you a story. For those of you who don't know, I grew up in North Carolina. I grew up in a small town. And in this small town, I went to uh, a small church. It was a rather large church for the size of the county, but in reality, it was a fairly small church. And this church was very particular about the way that you lived out your faith. Some might even call some of the things we did legalistic. All right? And I'll give you a couple examples that I think illustrate it well. One was our church had a very nice parking lot, it was very large. And so women during the week would typically come and they would just kind of walk circles around the church as a means of exercise and community. Well, over time, there were some men who decided, hey, I don't have anything else going on. It's a great place to exercise. This was before the Greenway and all that stuff was built. So they too started coming and walking circles around the church and exercising. Well, that didn't last long. It got brought to the attention of the leadership of the church that it just didn't look good to have men and women walking together around the church. And they actually instituted a, a rule that men and women that could not co-ed walk laps around the church and exercise for fear that it would look like they were falling into temptation to sin. That's ah, not a joke. I'm not making that up. Another instance, we had a, uh, a young girl who was a teenager who got her first job working at a, at a gas station. And as you might guess, that gas station sold alcohol. Well, in the church covenant, it said that as a member of that church, you're not allowed to participate in the consumption of or the buying and selling of alcohol. Well, some people had a huge problem with this young teenage girl working at the gas station selling alcohol. It wasn't her gas station. All she was doing was ringing people up. But it got brought to the deacons, to the leadership of the church, that something needed to be done about this young girl who was participating in this heinous act of scanning alcoholic beverages during the week. Now, nothing ended up being done about that. But I'm just showing you as an example, it's this type of legalistic thinking that enslaves us. This type of thinking is legalism, and Jesus has freed us from this mode of thinking. We've been given freedom in Christ, and we get so caught up in imposing a list of thou shalts and thou shalt nots on ourselves because we're scared if we allow ourselves to live fully in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, we're scared we'll mess it up. Well, let me, let me give you some encouragement. You will mess it up. In fact, you have messed it up. But God, in his grace, still loves you, and your salvation is secure in him. We're given freedom, and God knows that we're not perfect, that we will mess it up, but there's grace. Praise God, in Christ, there is freedom from legalism. Our second point here, in Christ, there's freedom from confusion. Pick up and read with me in verse 7. It says, you were running a good race. Who hindered you, or who cut in on you, the NIV says, to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. So someone or something has caused a great deal of confusion for the Christians in the Galatian church. And Paul has gone full mama bear about it. I mean, da Paul has busted out the dad voice. You know what I'm talking about? So before we, we dig into that, I want you to take a look here or take a listen we're talking about freedom from confusion in Christ. I found these uh, confusing headlines this week. Real headlines, I looked them up. Confusing headlines that'll make you think. So this headline says, statistics show that teen pregnancy drops off significantly after age 25. <laughs> well, I'd like to think it probably drops off significantly after about 19, you know, 18, 19, pshh. The next one says, we hate math, say four in 10, a majority of Americans. Oh, man. 
That's some longhorn math for you. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Uh, This one really got me here. Homicide victims rarely talk to police. Rarely. What about the ones that do? Those are the ones you should be worried about, right? Confusing, confusing headlines. What about this example here of how you can manipulate statistics? There's approximately 1.4 billion people in China. There's approximately 7 billion people in the world. So you can say statistically that one out of every five babies that are born are Chinese. Therefore, statistically speaking, if you have four children, there's a 100% chance that your next child will be Chinese. I'm just saying, don't be surprised. No, the truth is, if you don't carefully consider the information that you're being given and the information that's presented to you, then you can easily be manipulated. And the Galatian Christians were no different. Paul had preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to them, and they had received this precious gift of salvation. But not long after that, they had allowed these false teachings to cut in on them and their race, and they confused them regarding their freedom from obeying and keeping the law. Now, don't miss Paul's skillful wordplay in this text. He talks about, he said they were being pressured by these Judaizers to be circumcised. We all know that involves cutting, no object lesson needed, right? But then Paul casually asked them, who has cut in on you while you are running your race? And when you're running a race, you know that if someone cuts in on you, that could trip you up, cause you to fall, and it can do irreparable harm to the runner. That's the image that Paul is kind of painting here. But then Paul, he doesn't stop there, right? Like he's on a a late night rap battle on MTV. He drops the mic with a trifecta. And he says, you know, the Judaizers, they want you to participate in this activity of getting cut on. Who cut in on you while you were running your race? I wish they would just go the whole way and finish the job and cut it all off to emasculate themselves. You see Paul doing this skillfully. And that's some pretty extreme language from the apostle, right? If I'm being honest, it makes me feel a little bit better about some things I say in my head about some of your driving out here on 75 during the week. But unlike my internal road rage, the apostle's anger is justified. These Judaizers were compromising the gospel, and that is a big deal. It's a big deal to God. And Paul reminds his readers that these people were not the ones that called them to faith. God called them to faith by grace for freedom, freedom from this type of confusion. And this freedom includes freedom from confusion regarding the message of the gospel. Just like the unchecked yeast left in dough ruins it, verse 9 says that reverting back to circumcision causes confusion and corruption of the gospel. And verse 10 indicates that there is a penalty to pay for anyone who knowingly corrupts and confuses the message of the gospel. Paul makes a counterpoint here to his readers in verse 11 to address the accusation that he is still advocating for circumcision. In verse 11, he writes, Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, then why am I still being persecuted. Apparently, there was an accusation that these Judaizers were telling the Galatian Christians, you know, Paul was actually even telling you, like, this is part of the gospel. You should be circumcised. And Paul's like, no, if I'm still teaching this, then why are they persecuting me? If I'm teaching the same thing as them, we should be on the same page. Paul says, in that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. His point is, if he was still preaching circumcision, if that was part of the gospel, then the gospel message would not be offensive to these Judaizers. Well, how do we know that it was offensive? Really simple. People are not persecuted for non-offensive things. People are not persecuted for non-offensive things. So this leads us to believe that the Judaizers were preaching Jesus plus circumcision, at least in part, in order to avoid persecution from their peers and from the Roman government. So you could say that they were altering the message of the gospel by making it to be more in alignment with the current non-Christian practices. You know, these Judaizers, they may have said something along the lines of like, listen, I know you think that it will compromise your faith convictions as a follower of Jesus to get circumcised. But listen, if you'll just, just go along with it, just affirm it, and 
you will save yourself a whole lot of trouble and headache. Okay? Listen, you don't even have to be a vocal advocate for it. Nobody's asking you to hold a sign on the side of the road. Just don't speak out against it, and I think we'll be fine. But church, if Christians are no different than the rest of the world around them, then you have to ask yourself the question, has any real change even taken place in my life? Like I said earlier, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina, and uh, it was a very blue-collar community. It was a very Southern Baptist community. And so my hometown leans heavily in one particular political direction. Now, I'm not here to choose sides. I'll let you infer which one. And I only mention that because it's part of the story here. I keep up with a lot of my family and friends on social media, and I see this phenomenon happen almost weekly. I see one of my friends or family members that proclaim to be a follower of Jesus, and I see them on social media, and they are absolutely berating the opposing political party and anyone else who would be, quote, stupid enough to vote that way, right? And I'm sitting here reading this, and I'm thinking, stop. You say you are a follower of Jesus, and then you are acting this way. You're sending a confusing message about who the Jesus you say you represent is and what his gospel says. Jesus has set us free from confusion. Why are you misrepresenting him and contributing to people's confusion? You know, as believers, we are not called to view people the way that CNN or Fox News or NPR does. We're called to view people the way that God does. Are we allowed to disagree, make our own opinions? Absolutely. Are we allowed to tear people down simply only to elevate ourselves up and our opinions as correct? Certainly not. If we don't conform our political worldview, our opinions on social matters, everything about our lives to model after Jesus, what are we even doing, saying that we are followers of him. When we proclaim to follow Jesus and then we live a life that follows after the world, listen, we are just as guilty of confusing and corrupting the message of the gospel as these Judaizers were. I want to use the quell analogy once more here. Perhaps instead of telling people how confused they look walking around in circles, maybe we invite them to fly alongside of us as we seek to live out our faith in Jesus Christ. That is discipleship. Hey, I love Jesus. I'm a follower of him. I don't know it all. I don't have it all right, but come along with me and let's do this together. That is discipleship. That is what we are called to do, not to confuse people. So in Christ, there's freedom from legalism. There's freedom from confusion. And finally here, there's freedom to love. Verse 13 it says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So here in these three verses, Paul gets really practical. He kind of switches from theology to orthopraxy. How do you live it out? Paul reiterates Again, what he said in verse 1, that we have been given freedom in Christ. And now Paul moves forward, giving some positive instruction about how to live this life so as not to remain in another kind of slavery, slavery to our own flesh and our own passions. Now, some may call this type of teaching on freedom, quote, being given a license to sin. Paul says, no, 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 no. This is not an opportunity for the flesh to take over, leading a person deeper and deeper into vice. But this is an occasion for the spirit to take control and guide the believer into righteous living. We're not throwing away all the constraints of life. We're not giving up reasonable boundaries we put away or put in place for ourselves. We are encouraging yielding to the spirit and living in that freedom. But you know, freedom really is a scary concept. You ask the question, if, if we do take away some of these fences and barriers that we've put in our life and get rid of this confusing legalistic thinking, what's to keep us from being swallowed up by our own passions and desires? And Paul answers that question in verse 16. That's part of next week's text, and we're going to talk more about that, but the answer simply is yielding to the Spirit of God in our lives. 
living in the freedom that we have received, trusting that the spirit that has been poured out into our hearts will guide us in that process of sanctification. Paul knows that true freedom only exists when we fully submit every aspect of ourselves to the leading of the spirit. And according to Paul, the way we ensure that we are not abusing our freedom is by loving and serving others. Paul says in verse 13, uh, to serve one another, but serve doesn't quite capture what it is that Paul wants us to do. The, the word there is actually uh, the verbal form of a Greek word to enslave ourselves. But to say to enslave ourselves to one another is going a bit beyond what Paul is trying to say. The point he is making here is that we should be so heavily involved in the act of loving others through service that it looks as though we are enslaved to them in love. And Paul identifies loving and serving others with humility as the top priority use for our freedom in verse 13. And you may ask, well, is it really that simple? Does serving others in love really capture God's standards for Christian living and behavior? And in verse 14, Paul says, yeah, it is. You love God, you love others. And Jesus taught the exact same thing. Loving God and loving your neighbor, by doing that, you are fulfilling the law. Paul goes and he finishes here in verse 15 and he uses some colorful imagery to capture the ugly consequences of abusing your freedom. And he says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by one another. Paul's wording here in this verse creates an image of animals devouring and tearing into one another and creating chaos. And his command to serve one another through love stands at polar opposites of this dog-eat-dog -dog approach. You know, division and conflict, they are natural results of legalism and confusion. You have a conflicting list of rules, and then inevitably you have this person or these, this group of people who think they have the morality market cornered, and then it just causes constant conflict. You're not following these rules that we put in place. You're not following this law that we put in place. And we often forget that the consequence of this type of living is that a lot of people get chewed up, spit out, burned out, while other people are pursuing their hunger for power or being right and following rules. And that stands at the polar opposite to the gospel message of grace. I often ask my girls, especially when they're fighting, what does love require? And I think that's very appropriate for us to ask ourselves when we're in situations. What does love require? What does love require? In Christ, we have freedom to love. We have freedom to love even the most unlovable people because God has first loved us. There's freedom from legalism. There's freedom from confusion. And finally, there's freedom to love. So I'll close this out here. I'll share a quick story. My second semester in seminary, I had a professor who asked us to write a book review, which wasn't uncommon. And he told us, choose a book, write me a good book review on it, and turn it in. I said, okay, great. So I went to the syllabus and looked, and that was the only instructions. I was like, well, that's odd. So after class, I went up and asked him, hey, you know, with the book review, you know, how, how many pages do you want it to be? Five pages, eight pages? You know, he goes, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And I was like, which one, the shorter one or the longer one, you know? And he was like, listen, just go get a book, write a book review, write a good one, and turn it in. And I was like, yeah, but I, maybe you don't understand. Like, we don't have any directions. We don't have, like, page limits. We don't know really what all it's supposed to encompass. And he goes, yeah, I know. Just get a book, write a good book review, and turn it in. And I just, I could not wrap my head around having that much freedom. I've been in higher education for quite a while at this point, and I'm thinking I always have very prominent boundary lines. My left and right limits, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. But he had given us freedom to just write a paper. And that was a good lesson for me to learn as I thought about my freedom in Christ. There's sometimes very clear boundaries of what's right and what's wrong. It would have been wrong for me not to turn in a book review. Obviously, that's wrong. But he said, you know what? Get a book, write a good book review, and turn it in. You've got freedom to live out in this. And that was an awesome example for me as when we talk about comparing that to our freedom that we have in Christ. So how do we, how do we take what we have heard this morning and apply it to our lives? Here's what I want you to do. This week... Starting today, I want you to examine how is the Spirit leading you to run your own race of faith, particularly living it out.
by loving others and serving them. To draw an application on this, we have an excellent opportunity this morning, right now. You don't have to wait until next weekend. You don't have to wait until tomorrow. You can begin living this out today, saying, God, you have gifted me to serve others. Maybe you don't know what that looks like. Maybe you don't know what your gifts are, but you say, you know what? I know scripture teaches in order to love others well, I serve them. And you can get involved and you can begin serving here at your local church. And you can do that today. You can come talk to us down front. You can go downstairs to the commons and speak to them at guest services. But I guarantee you, if you come and you want to be involved, we will get you plugged in. And you can start living out your freedom in Christ through loving others in service here at your local church. Maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, oh, this sounds really good, Caleb. But I haven't even got to the point that I'm proclaiming faith in Jesus. Again, come down here this morning. I'd love to have a conversation with you about what it looks like to follow Jesus and to become a disciple of his. So as we pray, contemplate what it is that God is calling you to do. How is the Spirit leading you in your life? How can you get plugged in? How can you begin serving others and living out this freedom by loving your neighbor? Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with brothers and sisters in Christ. God, thank you for the grace that you have shown to us and the gift of salvation that comes through your son Jesus and his death and resurrection on the cross. Lord, I lift up those people that are here this morning and those who are watching online. God, I know there's many needs, there's many hearts that are hurting. God, there's so much pain and suffering and loss in this world. Catherine and I have lost three close friends this week from where we grew up through tragic disease and accidents, God. And it's, it's caused us to remember that this life is fragile and it is short. God, and as believers in Jesus, we are called to seize every opportunity, God, to model you, to image you, God, and to do that by loving others well. So as we go out today, God, put it upon our hearts to ask the question, what does love require? How do I respond in this situation? Well, what does love require? How do I parent my children through this? Well, what does love require? Help us to live in the freedom that you have given us in Christ. Not a freedom that is to be used for our own benefit, to pursue our own passions, but freedom to listen to this to the voice of the Spirit in our lives, to yield to him in all that we do and trust God that you are working through our lives. As we go today, I pray blessings over everyone in this place. It's in Jesus' name, amen.